Hello there, my name is Mauricio and I'll be talking about how to draw numeric values directly from shaders on the screen using GPU-driven rendering. The process can be applied to your application after you have drawn your scene and can be used to display simple numeric values or more complex glyphs for debugging. I'll start by going over what GPU-driven rendering is to give you a little background on what the procedure looks like. I'll go over the general idea by going into details of how to draw line segments from shaders and expand that idea to draw actual numerical values directly on screen. At the end, I'll talk briefly about other considerations. GPU-driven rendering is when we do most of the rendering from the GPU itself. We'll do that here without mesh shaders or any other advanced features. We'll record line segments from shaders and display them at a later render pass. The CPU is involved only to issue draw calls, install memory barriers to ensure that the algorithm works, and to clear the buffer we'll use to store the line segments. The procedure of drawing line segments from shaders needs three main things. A device buffer that will be written to from most render passes and read from when the lines are drawn, a piece of shader injected into every render pass in which you'd like to record line segments, and an extra render pass along with barriers, to draw the lines recorded in the previous render passes. After the lines are drawn, you will also want to clear the buffer's header and the draw indirect structure in the buffer for the next frame. Here's a diagram of the process. For an application with n render passes, the yellow elements in the diagram, you will need to inject shader code into all shaders used in the render passes. A shader code is simply a function and a few structure definitions that allow you to record the line segment information. You will also need to provide a device buffer, the blue element in the diagram, that will be written from all render passes and read from when the final segments are drawn onto the screen. Additionally, you will need two memory barriers, the green steps in the diagram. The first ensures that the buffer has been written to from the render passes. The second barrier ensures that the rendering of the lines has finished before the buffer's header and metadata are cleared for the next frame. The device local buffer, which is created with the VK buffer usage indirect buffer bit flag, needs to be big enough to accommodate the header and metadata, the VK draw indirect command structure, and space for a number of lines. Each line is defined as a start and end vertices and the vertices colors. Vertices are defined by their X, Y, Z, and W components. The colors are defined by their R, G, B, and A components. The first part of the buffer stores information about the entire buffer, along with padding to allow the VK draw indirect command structure, also stored in the buffer, to be aligned. In the metadata, we store the maximum number of lines that can be recorded to the buffer. This dictates the size of the buffer, which must be defined in the application. Once the buffer is created and this number is uploaded to the device, it never changes. It's the first value in the metadata. In our example, we initialize this number to be 65,000 lines. The second value in this section is how many rows have been recorded to the buffer. That information will be used in the next part of the presentation, where we draw values from shaders. Each numeric value will occupy one row on the screen. This number must begin with zero for every frame, but it's not used for drawing line segments. The next section of the buffer is the VK draw indirect command structure itself. The only field in the structure that is initialized is the vertex count, which is initialized to two as we are drawing line segments. The other fields must remain at zero. Vertex count will be modified directly from the shader, while first vertex and first instance remain at zero. The last part of the buffer is an array of lines, each with two vertices defined as X, Y, Z, and W, and two colors with components R, G, B, and A. Here's the shader code used to store the lines information into the buffer. The shader defines the buffer structure, just like the picture shown in the previous slides. It first defines a line with two vertices, each with a color. Then the VK draw indirect command structure. And finally, the array of lines. 
In the code fragment, we're binding the buffer to set 4, binding 0. The shader code used to record the line information is defined in a function called addLine that accepts the two vertices of the line segment and their colors. The functions start by reading the number of lines already in the buffer from the buffer's metadata and increments it by one atomically. This indicates the index that will be used for the current line being added. If the current index is larger than the maximum number of lines allowed in the buffer, the number of lines stored in the buffer is reset to the number that was previously in the buffer. Otherwise, the vertex and color information are then stored in the array of lines that are part of the buffer. The index is the one we obtained before, IDX. The shader code used in the extra render pass needed to draw the lines does not define the header of the buffer as it only requires the array of lines. For this to work, the buffer is bound for this render pass with an offset to the beginning of the section that stores the line information. In the code fragment, we're using set1 and binding0 as the read-only buffer that contains the array of lines to be drawn. The main function of the vertex shader of the line rendering pass picks the starting or end vertices for a line depending on the value of GL vertex index and outputs its X, Y, and W components and the vertices color. The fragment shader only outputs the color of the lines and is not shown here. In summary, the process consists of injecting a special shader fragment to all render passes you'd like to record line segments from, bind the lines as buffer, and call add line to add a line segment. The lines are drawn on a separate and additional render pass that runs at the end of all render passes you would like to instrument. Before the draw call, you need to install a barrier to ensure that the buffer is not being modified, bind the lines as buffer with an offset to the array of lines, and issue a draw indirect call. Once that render pass is submitted for processing, another barrier is necessary to ensure that the buffer isn't being read anymore before you can clear the buffer's header with VK command fill buffer. Now let's extend that process to draw values from shaders. Digits are represented in a seven segment style with an extra one for the decimal separator. The segments vertices are pre-recorded on an array of VAC2s, while the actual segments are stored as indices to the vertices on an array of UVAC2s. The shader code injected into the render passes now adds four functions used to parse and decompose digits into their segments. To print a floating point value, all you need to do is call parse with the value as a parameter. The parse function first increments the number of rows in the buffer, calls print digit for the minus sign if the number is negative, and then calls print number for the integer part and for the decimal part in that order. The number of rows is the second value stored in the buffer that was not used in the previous section. Here, that value indicates in which row the number will be drawn. Only one value is allowed per row. The print number function parses and decomposes the number, now an integer, into its digits. For each one, it calls the print digit function with the actual digit as an integer. The print digit function is a big switch statement that calls print segment a number of times, depending on the digit being printed. This function also computes the scale and translation of each digit based on the row they are occupying. On the slide, we can see that for the digit 1, print digit will call print segment twice, one for segment number 2 and again for segment number 5. The picture on the left shows how those two segments represent the number 1 on the screen using the seven segment format. Also, on the slide, we can see how the decimal represented by the digit 10 just records the segment number 7. The minus sign is segment 3. Finally, the print segment function selects the correct segment information from the statically defined segment array and scales it according to the row and column of the digit and stores the segments into the buffer by calling the addLine function defined in the previous section. Here's an example output of the process. 
The code on the right issued for GL vertex index equals zero prints a few numbers from the render passes shader that draws the duck. The result is on the right. Even though the process is quite intrusive and it may be harder to implement and use than just recording a frame with a capture tool, it may be used in situations where it's hard to capture a frame, such as with head-mounted devices, VR or AR headsets, or mobile devices. Since not all vertex or fragment instances of the shaders can print values, there needs to be some sort of control to limit the number of values being printed. The method may also help with real-time scenarios where a glitch is hard to capture or happens infrequently and momentarily. The process can be expanded to include other glyphs, perhaps some dynamic ones like direction of light, counters, and etc. And finally, the process can be expanded to draw lines in 3D by also storing a transformation matrix for each line, allowing us to draw normals, skybox, edges, light directions, and so on. Thank you.